on the show, it's the epic history of House Baratheon. Yes, Stannis has the king's nuts. The king's nuts. So today on the show, we're going to be talking about the history of House Baratheon. First off, we're going to start with the distant past and lore, and then go up to the founding of House Baratheon with Oris Baratheon. And then we're going to be talking about your present day Baratheons, we're going to be talking about some Baratheon bastards, we're also going to be doing some Onion Knight and Melisandre business, so it should be pretty awesome. Wait a minute, uh, who all are the Baratheons? I forgot. Well, Robot, the Baratheons that you know and love uh, from the start of Game of Thrones consist of three brothers. You have Robert, middle child Stannis, and then bringing up the rear, you have Renly. But also on the side, you do have Gendry, who is one of Robert Baratheon's bastard sons. So he's kind of, he's not really a Baratheon, but I'll count him. Technically, Robert has a lot of bastards. A lot of them were taken out by Joffrey when he did that crazy culling of the city. But I'm sure there's still some more running around. I actually think there's one in the Vale, Maya Stone, but you haven't met her yet, so shh, don't tell anybody. I'm sure I've got a lot of bastards around town. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Back to the Baratheons. If you remember, their sigil is a black stag on a golden field. Their house motto is, ours is the fury. And their seat of power is at Storm's End. Although after Robert's Rebellion, it's kind of spawned two cadet branches because then you have the Baratheons in the Red Keep and then you also have Stannis on Dragonstone. So they kind of have like three seats right now, which is pretty badass. Is it time to talk about Stannis yet? Almost. So to understand the history of House Baratheon, you have to go all the way back to the Age of Heroes before there even was a House Baratheon. Back to the original Storm Kings. So the legend of Storm's End begins with King Durin I, otherwise known as God's Grief, who ends up marrying a couple of God's daughter, Elani. Now her dad and mom were the sea god and the wind goddess, right? So if you piss those guys off, they're gonna get together and make some fucked up storms. So that's what happened. And that's why Storm's End ended up becoming so damn stormy because this king pissed off these gods. So that explains that whole deal. Anyways, he marries the daughter on their wedding night. The mom and the dad get together, fucking create a storm so bad that it kills all the wedding guests except for Durin and his wife and he's so pissed that he vows revenge and he just keeps building crazier and crazier castles which Alani's mom and dad keep just battering down over and over again until the seventh castle which is Storm's End which is still standing today and the reason that it might still be standing is because the children of the forest may have had some hand in it, or even Bran the Builder is rumored to have helped construct this building. So there may be some spells going on in there, we're not entirely sure. So this crazy legendary castle of Storm's End would eventually become the seat of House Baratheon many generations later. So where did the Baratheons come in then? So the founding of House Baratheon occurred during Aegon's conquest. And that's because the Baratheons owe their entire family lineage to the Targaryens. And here's how it happened. Now, Oris Baratheon was not only rumored to be Aegon's bastard brother, who probably has half Targaryen blood, but he was also a commander in his army and his homeboy. So during the conquest of Westeros, Aegon had his homeboy Oris and his sister wife Rhaenys fly over to the Stormlands to take Storm's End on Meraxxus the Dragon. And when they get over there, the last Storm King, Argilac Durendon the Arrogant, comes out in the field and is easily defeated. Then Argella, his daughter, ends up proclaiming herself Storm Queen since her dad is dead and starts defending Storm's End against Oris and Rhaenys. But the people of Storm's End are like, yo, these people got a dragon and you're gonna get us all killed by being an asshole. So they end up taking Argella, wrapping her in chains, taking all her clothes off, delivering her naked to Oris, saying, please just don't kill us with your dragon. And instead of being a dick, Oris shows mercy, covers Argella with his cloak, marries her, mingles their houses, and the rest is history. So the Baratheons would continue to be friends and allies with the Targaryens for the next few centuries, and even help them during the Blackfyre Rebellion. 
and Princess Rael Targaryen even married into the Baratheon family, eventually giving birth to Stefan Baratheon, who is the father of Robert, Stannis, and Renly. So the Baratheons really do have Targaryen blood. Is this where Stannis comes in? Not quite yet. So let's skip the next 300 years to the birth of Robert, Stannis, and Renly. And as it turns out, these guys suffered a traumatic childhood experience. So when they were young, the Mad King Ares asked their parents, Stefan and Kasana Baratheon, to travel all the way to the Free Cities in an attempt to find Rhaegar Targaryen a bride. But the trip was totally unsuccessful. They didn't find anybody, so they decided to travel back empty-handed. They know their parents are coming home. They're waiting for them. They see their ship coming into the bay. And then out of nowhere, a freak storm happens, destroys the ship, killing their parents right in front of them. And Stannis and Robert watch helplessly while their parents' ship is destroyed and sinks to the bottom of Shipbreaker Bay. So after the untimely demise of his parents, Robert Baratheon is shipped off to be fostered in the Eyrie by a childless John Aaron, and that's where he meets Ned Stark, and they become total besties super quick. And they become such BFFs that Robert ends up falling for Ned's sister Lyanna and is set to marry her so he can become Ned's bro for real. And I think that really... Robert would have been happy marrying anyone just about because he just doesn't care because he's a slut butt. So like the only reason he really fell for Liana and wanted to be with her was really because he wanted to be totally like in the same family as Ned. I mean, if you think about it, at the beginning of Game of Thrones, he's trying to mingle their houses through their kids. This guy really wants to be like super bros with Ned. If your sister had lived, would have been bound by blood. Well, it's not too late. I have a son, you have a daughter, we'll join our houses. And as you know, while Ned and Robert are being fostered in the Eyrie and this whole thing's set up with Lyanna, Lyanna ends up being uh, kidnapped by Rhaegar, which sets off the whole Robert's Rebellion thing in motion. Okay, they're about like 16 too when this whole thing starts. Just saying, like, it's pretty nuts. How many 16 year olds do you know that can mount a rebellion? They can't even get off their asses. They're all fat now. <laughs> so the War of the Usurper gets kicked off. Robert's Rebellion, you already know all about it from our Stark video. You wanna check that out if you're behind? No, nope, forgot all that. Tell me again. Since I've already talked about Robert's Rebellion in three other epic reviews, we're gonna just do a speed recap right now, go. Robert's Rebellion in a nutshell. So Robert and Ned hanging out. Robert's supposed to marry Lyanna, Ned's sister. Lyanna gets snatched by Rhaegar Targaryen, the son of the king, and then Robert's brother and dad and some other bros end up going down there to get Lyanna back. They end up getting cooked alive in their armor. It's a total bummer for everybody. That starts the whole war off. Everyone gets super pissed. There's a big battles here and there, and then Robert wins the Iron Throne, but ultimately loses Lyanna, who dies mysteriously in Ned's arms, which he has never told what the fuck was going on. So now, let's talk about the history of Robert Baratheon. So Robert Baratheon, growing up, he was the eldest of the three Baratheon brothers, and he was super charming and like really fun-loving. He was a really good fighter, uh, very spirited, and he was also super handsome back in the day. He looked like a romance novel cover guy or something. He was like super buff and like just had this giant war hammer and was just like totally hot. Uh, and he was also a slut. I think we all know that. He was always spreading his wild oats all over the all over the kingdoms trying to make the eight. And the thing about Robert is, is that Robert is just a great fighter. He's just an amazing fighter and just not a good leader. You know, you, you can't have it all. You can't be a fighter and a leader. Some people are both, some people aren't. He's not one of them. So once he gets the throne, he just doesn't know what to do anymore. Like his purpose, he's peaked. He's peaked. His purpose in life is over. His purpose is being strong and tough and he defeated this guy and then now he has nothing to do. So he just gets fat and drinks a bunch of wine and fucks a bunch of whores and... I bet you smell a blackberry in your house. Let me smell it. Come here. You know, makes some... Tries to make kids with Cersei. I mean, we all know that doesn't work out very well, but... Was it ever possible for us? Was there ever a time, ever a moment? No. 
And the thing about Robert that's really interesting is that when Robert took the throne, even though Mad King Ares was kind of fucking out of his gourd, he still had a surplus of gold. Like that dude had like money just stored away everywhere. And then when Robert comes into power, Robert essentially just beggars the realm. I mean, he just like spends all this money on like tourneys and feasts and all this fuckery. So by the time he dies, the whole realm is just in just so much debt. It's just staggering. It's just staggering. Are you telling me the crown is three million in debt? I'm telling you the crown is six million in debt. How could he let this happen? The master of coin finds the money, the king and the hand spend it. I will not believe John Arryn allowed Robert to bankrupt the realm. Lord Arryn gave wise and prudent advice, but I fear his grace doesn't always listen. Counting coppers, he calls it. So, you know, Robert may have been a good guy, but he was definitely a shitty king of Westeros. So Stannis then, right? It's not Stannis yet. So after Robert's coronation onto the Iron Throne, but before the events of Game of Thrones, there was the Greyjoy Rebellion. Ooh, what's that? All right. So since Robert was newly on his throne, Balin Greyjoy, Theon Greyjoy's dad, was like, well, uh, this guy's a noobler, and let's test him, and fuck this guy. I think that we can get away with this. And he declares himself the king of the Iron Islands and is trying to secede from the Union, essentially. Also, another reason why the Greyjoys decided to do this was because during Robert's Rebellion, uh, everyone involved with that took a lot of heavy losses. All of the houses, a lot of their vassals were taken out. But the Greyjoys never entered Robert's Rebellion, so they were totally fine. They haven't lost any ships or any men. They're at total full strength when the rest of the realm is still staggering a little bit. What's the Greyjoys' problem? Well, the Greyjoys are just some salty motherfuckers, you know? That's just their problem. They're, that's how they roll. So, they're just kind of dicks. It's because they live in Pike, where it's just like, there's no plants, and it's just like depressing, and there's just rocks and sea, and that's it. So they're just kind of tougher people, you know? And the thing that I like most about the Greyjoy Rebellion is the fact that there's like so many people from the Game of Thrones era that were involved in it, so it's really fun to hear about them all getting together and like getting in this little fray. Uh, first of all, you have Stannis and Paxter Redwine, and they're in charge of like, smashing the Iron Islands fleet, which they totally do. They take the biggest island, Great White, where Barris and Selmy, who's now with Daenerys, he was there and he was like leading the attack. Okay, that's totally awesome. And then on the main battle over on Pike, you have Thoros of Myrrh being the first one through the breach. You have Jorah Mormont there who wins his knighthood that day, as well as Ned, like they were all there. Ned was involved in this whole thing too. So this battle was pretty interesting, I think, just because it just has so many players in it. And after this Greyjoy rebellion was put down by all these badasses, Theon Greyjoy, who is the last surviving son of Balin Greyjoy, is then taken as a captive and is raised with the Starks. So that's where Theon came from. He came from the Greyjoy Rebellion. Stannis. <laughs> so now it's time to talk about everyone's favorite Baratheon, Stannis, the middle brother. Yes, finally. Yeah, I know, Robot, you like Stannis. Stannis is the rightful king. You might be the only one, but that's okay. Someone for everyone. Go Stannis. Woo. The Iron Throne is mine, by right. All those that deny that to my foes. Old realm denies it from dawn to the wall. Old men deny it with their death rattle and unborn children deny it in their mother's wombs. No one wants you for their king. You never wanted any friends, brother. But a man without friends is a man without power. So Stannis, where do we start with Stannis? Well, uh, currently, Stannis is married to Selyse Florent. He has one daughter named Shireen, who has grayscale on half of her face. It's like kind of like a fucked up chicken pox, and so she's like half kind of scarred up and weird. Uh, and Stannis is like the Khloe Kardashian of like the three Baratheon brothers. He's like kind of like the bummer one that nobody really likes. And he's always known that. Like he totally has middle child syndrome for sure. Like that's not 
even arguable. I mean, he is always obsessing over slights, you know, whether they're real slights or whether they're imagined. He's like grinding his teeth. I'm sure he's got ulcers, you know, he's just, He's so down in the mouth about everything. And the thing is, is like he just doesn't understand because he's capable. It's not like Stannis isn't a fucking badass because he totally is. We're too far from the gates. Fire. There are archers. Hundreds will die. Thousands. Because if you think about it, I mean, he's done some pretty incredible crazy shit. Like, he smashed the Iron Fleet, you know, and took Great Wyke. He held Storm's in for like almost a year against Mace Tyrell, which like unintentionally tied up the Tyrell forces, which kept them out of Robert's Rebellion, which really helped Robert in a lot of ways. He ended up taking Dragonstone for Robert. And the thing that's so funny is like, he does all this stuff. He does everything that's asked of him, you know, because he's just one of those people, you know, he believes in honor and all that stuff. But then it's like, even though he does all this stuff and he does it successfully, he still gets shit on, you know? Cause Robert, instead of giving Stannis Storm's End, which is, I guess, a tastier castle. It's got uh, a lot more riches and lands and vassals and things like that. Robert ends up giving Stannis Dragonstone because of a couple reasons. Because Robert unfairly blames Stannis for the escape of Viserys and Daenerys because he was going over there to grab them, but they were spirited away across the fucking sea before he could get there. So Robert's always blamed him for that when it's really not his fault. So, and he also gave Stannis Dragonstone to get Stannis the hell away from him because he just didn't like him. But Stannis was still on the small council. He was the master of ships. And, you know, honestly, I kind of feel bad for Stannis. I do. You know, it's like if somebody just, I don't know, maybe if Patchface hadn't drowned and gotten all weird, maybe he could have taught Stannis how to laugh. Who knows? But that ship has sailed. Another interesting thing about Stannis is you think about him and Melisandre and he's taken on the Red Woman's gods and, you know, that's kind of a big thing. Like, cause that's a very foreign and exotic god from like the land, like Shadowlands of Ashai or some shit. So it's like, it's kind of weird for him to be doing that because he's such a straight and narrow guy. You think he'd totally be down with the Seven, but he renounced the Seven the day that his parents died and he never forgave those gods for that. He was like, fuck them, this sucks. We offer you these false gods. Take them and cast your light upon us. For the night is dark and full of terrors. All you men were named in the light of the seven. Is this how you treat the gods of your fathers? And that's why he was so easily taken in by Melisandre because, you know, he's ready for some new gods. He hates those old gods for taking his parents away when he was a kid, which I'm sure didn't help with his disposition. And if you remember, the Siege of Storm's End was where Ser Davos got his knighthood from Stannis because Stannis was stuck in there, as I said, for almost a year. They had eaten all of their horses. They had eaten cats, dogs, rats. They were getting ready to eat their own friggin' dead, okay? And they were like trying not to, but it was there and they were thinking about it. And then you have Ser Davos, the smuggler, who comes in, goes through Shipbreaker Bay and smuggles in all these onions and salt fish which gives them just enough nourishment to hold on until Ned Stark comes over after the sacking of King's Landing. And Mace Tyrell, as soon as he sees Ned, dips his banners immediately. So Ned really didn't break the seat. I mean, he did, but he really didn't do anything. He just kind of stopped. But it's really Stannis who just held out. That's, that's what saved Storm's End. It wasn't Ned, it was Stannis. But Robert, again, just ended up thanking Ned for the whole deal and pooping on Stannis, even though he almost starved to death for the fucking castle. No wonder Stannis hates everybody. And my favorite tidbit about Stannis Baratheon is the fact that it was Stannis and not really Jon Arryn that kicked off this whole Game of Thrones nonsense. Oh. That's right, robot. It was your boy who started this whole deal. It isn't really explained in the show, but in the books, Stannis was at King's Landing a lot more because he was on the small council. And he was always hanging out with Jon Arryn, and it was really him and Jon Arryn that tried to run the country while Robert was off whoring and drinking and being crazy. So 
Stannis was the one who originally did not believe that Cersei's children were his brother's children. He was the first one who had an inkling on that one. And he brought his suspicions to John Aaron instead of his own brother because if he had talked to Robert about it, who he already had a stony, rocky relationship with to begin, uh, Robert would have just accused him of trying to set himself up as the next heir because if all of Cersei's children were illegitimate, that would make Stannis the next in line. So Stannis knew that Robert would not listen to anything that he had to say. So that's why he went through John Aaron instead. So it was Stannis and John Aaron that went all over town checking on Robert's bastards, checking their hair and eye color to see what the fuck was going on with genetics. So yeah. It was Stannis the whole time. He really is like the, he is. The rifle king, the rifle king, the rifle king. <laughs> I mean, Stannis is the rifle king. Stannis is the rightful king, according to their laws. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that it was really Stannis and not John Aaron who uh, s started this whole deal. I think that's I think that's really cool. I wish they had kind of put that in the show, but you know, it's they do what they can. They still do a good job on the show. The Iron Throne is mine by right. The thing that I think is so fascinating about Stannis is that he's this upright stickler, straight and narrow type of guy who cares about upholding rules and laws and honor codes. Yet he is the one who is turning to the occult and he is resorting to this mysterious red magic, something that you'd think a person like Stannis would never be dealing with. But at this point, Stannis has come to realize that the only way that he is ever going to become the king of Westeros is if he turns to alternative means, things that he doesn't have a true grasp or understanding of, something that could be really dangerous, but that's the only option he has left. And that's it for Stannis. You know, I think he's the most complex and interesting Baratheon, in my opinion. That's what I've been trying to do, Ellie? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Everyone knows you like Stannis, okay? So where does the future of Stannis, you know, when's he gonna get on the throne, basically? Tell, tell us that. Well, I don't know if Stannis is ever gonna climb onto the Iron Throne or not, um, but it's really interesting, his relationship with Melisandre, and you think to yourself, is she just running a game on him, or does she really believe that he's like, Rolor, come back? Like, you don't know? Ugh, it's like, I can't wait to find out, though. Yes, Stannis has a king's nuts. <laughs> So last but not least, let's do a brief history of Renly Baratheon. He did. He did. But before he did, he was the master of laws on Robert's small council. He was very well liked, very charming and charismatic. Uh, he was a very sunny child. And when Robert's rebellion was going on, he was really young. He was too young to be involved. So he was just kind of like put somewhere safe out of the way while it was all going on. So he didn't even fight in the rebellion. He was just a kid. So. I never really believed you were a fanatic. Charmless, rigid, a bore, yes, but, but not a godly man. You should kneel before your brother. He's the Lord's chosen. Born amidst salt and smoke. Born amidst salt and smoke? Is he a ham? In the books, he's like supposed to be super handsome. And he ends up meeting Loras because Loras becomes his squire. And then comes a little more than that. Let's talk about where Renly went wrong. Okay. As the first, he's not Stannis. <laughs> and second, as the Lady Olena put it, he knew how to smile and he knew how to dress and he knew how to bathe and somewhere he got the notion that that made him fit to be king. And I think that that sums it up pretty well because even though he was well-liked, charming, attractive and, and all these wonderful things and people liked him over his brother Stannis, he still really didn't have a claim on the throne. So if he had just worked with Stannis and helped Stannis's PR, you know, I think that he could have been at least hand of the king. But then again, I don't know, because maybe Stannis would harbor a grudge and then like have him go live at fucking Dragonstone just to be a bitch. I don't know. Stannis certainly pulls some bitch moves on Renly, so, you know, wouldn't put it past him. I murdered my brother. 
We murdered him. Why are you dressed like Little Red Riding Hood? What's going on with you? I'm a red priest from Shy. <laughs> if I truly believe that Stannis is the rightful king, then I must take up his religion as well. I don't want to be an infidel like you. So now let's talk about the top three Baratheon bastards. Number three top bastard. Edric Storm. Uh, he's a really fun character, but he is only to be found in the books. He's not in the show, uh, which is kind of sad and regrettable, but it's okay because I'm going to tell you about him right now. Go. All right. So Edric Storm is the son of Robert and Delana Florent, and it's a really juicy piece of gossip as to how he was conceived. So when Stannis was marrying Selyse Florent during the wedding, before Stannis could get up to his wedding bed with his bride, Robert ends up hooking up with Delana Florent in their wedding bed, conceiving Edric Storm right then and there. And Stannis was like, so bummed that Robert did that, and it's totally hilarious. Pretty awesome. Anyways, since Edric was conceived on a highborn lady, Edric was publicly acknowledged by Robert, and he was brought up in Storm's End, so I mean, he wasn't like out on the street or anything. And in fact, when Stannis ends up taking Storm's End from Renly, he ends up taking the bastard back to Dragonstone and he ends up hanging out with Shireen a little bit. And it's interesting here because in the show, you have Melisandre trying to convince Stannis to kill Gendry to get uh, some magic blood out of him. But in the books, it's Edric Storm that she's trying to get the blood out of, and she's trying to sacrifice this little bastard boy. And at first, Stannis is like, no, 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 you can't kill him. You know, that's kind of a bummer. And Davos knows that fucking Stannis is totally gonna end up bending to Melisandre's will because he always does. So he ends up sending Edric across the free cities and he's got like a little escort there, and so he's safe in the free cities, so. You told me your magic requires a king's blood. Yes. I'm the one true king. You are. But there are others with your blood in their veins. Number two, top bastard. Gendry. So Gendry is uh, from King's Landing. So he was from Robert's time at King's Landing. He boned some ale house worker chick. She ended up dying when Gendry was really young. Instead of being orphaned, he was taken to the blacksmith and paid the double the customary fee. So he had an angel looking out for him and that's how he ended up at the blacksmith shop. And as we all know, Gendry ends up joining with the Brotherhood Without Banners and works as a smith for them. So that's kind of his story. It's a long and short of it. Moving on. Number one, top bastard. My favorite Baratheon bastard, Maya Stone. You don't know about her yet, but she should be in this upcoming season, in season four, and I'm really excited to see her. She is Robert's eldest bastard child. She was fathered while Robert was being fostered at the Eyrie, if that gives you any indication of when she was born. And she vaguely remembers him as this man who would toss her up into the air when she was a little kid. And he even almost brought her to court. He was thinking about it, but then he like realized that Cersei would just try to kill her or something. So he just ended up not doing it at all after he punched Cersei in the face or something. So there was a whole thing about that, but you will meet her. She's at the Eyrie. She's very much like her father. She's got short black hair and beautiful blue eyes. And she's very uh, lusty and brusque. And she helps people up the mountain with her donkeys. And she's a total badass and she's a lot of fun. So I'm really looking forward to seeing Maya Stone this season, my favorite Baratheon bastard. You go girl. Oh, you go girl. <laughs> you go girl. So what's the deal with Melisandre? So now let's talk about Melisandre, the red priestess of Rolor. Oh, yeah. what's her deal? Tell me. As I said, she's a red priestess from the shadow of a shy, which is way the fuck over in Essos. And she came to Dragonstone because she believes that she received a prophecy in the flames that Azor Ahai was going to be reborn and that it was Stannis Baratheon. You must have faith. Faith? I have seen the path to victory in the flames. And Azor Ahai is kind of like the Jesus to the red priest and priestesses, you know? He's kind of like their, their dude. Okay. 
Mystery fun fact about Melisandre, she may be far older than she looks, uh, but because of magic, she still stays young and all this stuff. And it may be that because there are dragons again, the dragons have been reborn, that her powers have grown exponentially. So, you know, I think that's a pretty safe bet. Anyways, she started out in the free cities as a little girl named Mallory, and she was a slave on like lot seven or something, and was bought by the Red Priesthood and brought up as a priestess. So, you know, she's super pumped about that. She's really into her religion. She's kind of a zealot. You can't really trust her. I don't know. She seems a little shifty. She might be fucking with Stannis. I don't know if she really believes that he's the one or if she's just using him for something else. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. So, who's Azor Zuzu? Now, according to prophecy in the ancient books of Ashai, Azor Ahai will be reborn again after a long summer when the others return. Which, I mean, that's kind of happening now. I mean, it's happening. But their prophecy states, there will come a day after a long summer when the stars bleed and the cold breath of darkness falls heavy on the world. In this dread hour, a warrior shall draw from the fire a burning sword, and that sword shall be Lightbringer, the red sword of heroes, and he who clasps it shall be Azor Ahai, come again, and the darkness shall flee before him. So that's the prophecy that Melisandre is working from, and then she gets a vision that that guy is supposed to be Stannis. So she goes there. Who knows? Melisandre once said, when the red star bleeds and the darkness gathers, Azor Ahai shall be born again amidst smoke and salt to wake dragons out of stone. Well, I already know somebody was born again out of smoke and woke dragons out of stone. And it ain't Stannis. Do you see my king? Yes. I think poor Stannis is being taken for a ride. Kind of feel bad for him. That guy, that guy is nobody's fucking anybody come again. Stannis. Stannis. No, no, it's Stannis. Totally Stannis. It's all Stannis? You're full of yourself. <laughs> Time for gonna use anything about Game of Thrones. You're right, I don't know anything about it. Stannis is gonna come again and prove you are an idiot. I'll be You're waiting. Gonna be so wrong. You're gonna be so wrong. So wrong. Stannis is gonna do it all. It's gonna save. Stannis Baratheon is gonna be the one that saves Westeros. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yes. I, I, totally. you, I believe. Yes. I believe that he could have a hand in it, but I don't know if I had put all my eggs in the Stannis basket. You should put all your eggs in Stannis Baratheon. Vote Stannis. They'll bend the knee or I'll destroy them. So that's it for our epic history, House Baratheon. If you've enjoyed yourself, feel free to subscribe to my channel, uh, like this video, and also feel free to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr for all your Comic Book Girl 19 news and updates. And be sure also to check out the rest of our epic history videos if you haven't already, and get educated, because Game of Thrones is a lot of stuff to learn.